So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Gilbert Gallegos, uh, Communications Director of the Albuquerque Police Department. Uh, we're having this news conference today. We're, it's kind of, we're going to treat it kind of informally to talk about officer-involved shooting trends and statistics over the past five years since we've been here. Uh, we've gone through a lot of demographics and as much as we can get out of the reports and that sort of thing, just to give us a better idea of what trends exist. I think Chief and I have been to almost, almost all of the OIS is over the past five years, and uh, we have our own observations, so Chief will, will get into that a little bit. Before we start, though, I do want to acknowledge that while we're going to be talking about statistics and trends, um, I do want to acknowledge the incident that happened overnight, and it, be mindful of the fact that um, this involved a real people, a real person who lost his life. It involved officers who were put in a position to make a decision to use deadly force and we know that this affects every officer who is put in that position and will affect their lives you know going forward and families and untold others so you know i don't want that to get lost in the discussion about statistics um and chief will talk a little bit about his experiences and, and reinforce that and with that i'm just going to have chief talk a little bit about the incident just a little bit of an update and then we'll get into the slide presentation you know as uh we go through the the presentation today we uh, offer raw statistics and data as it's related to a lot of different uh, groups and uh, individuals that were involved in these incidents. I think it's important that we kind of look at what we're seeing as a community and a trend. And one of the things that we're going to be talking about and that we could quickly identify with over the past uh, five years is like we have three principal areas where officer involved shootings are occurring. And the first one is, is being, uh, you know, the attempt to apprehend a violent criminal. We have seen this, had a shooting earlier this year off of, uh, of uh, Wyoming and Osuna where officers taking a, attempting to take an armed robbery suspect into custody. Uh, we had a violent criminal who had stolen a bait car who fired out of the back of a bait car. So we have those types of officer involved shootings that are, are directly involved in apprehending some of the most violent to dangerous people in the city of Albuquerque. We also have another subgroup of uh, incidents where individuals are suffering uh, some kind of mental health episode and who are going through some kinds of issues. Uh, we have, uh, as we term them, suicide by cop. And we've had several of these incidents through uh, the past uh, several years. And it looks like, you know, this year it looks like we even see possibly an increase in that. And the third area is, you know, we have, you know, individuals who sometimes have very little criminal record, but they're under the influence of some kind of intoxicating drug or alcohol and uh, they make poor decisions. And uh, we've talked about that recently, like it is not responsible to be in possession of a firearm as you're intoxicated. And a lot of bad things are gonna happen, especially if you decide to handle that firearm in the presence of officers without communication. So uh, last night's incident uh, fits that category all over again. It's an individual who uh, the Valley Area Command had been dealing with. They've actually arrested the individual three times in the past three months. Uh, they're working with our uh, crisis intervention unit to get this individual the help they need. Uh, he was released from court, uh, we think somewhere around uh, November 3rd. Uh, there was an episode at a local bank yesterday where this individual uh, broke a window, started yesterday about nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, from that broken window, it proceeded to uh, officers are looking for this individual during the course of the day. During that interaction where he was frustrated because he couldn't use his ATM card, he did threaten uh, individuals at the bank who had called police. Uh, we fast forward a little bit over 12 hours and uh, this individual ends up outside of the prisoner transport unit. He'd actually been criminal trespassed for causing disturbances at the criminal, uh, at, the crim at the prisoner transport unit in the past. And uh, the prisoner transport unit asks for uniformed officers to address and to uh, talk to this individual. They're already looking for him and, and had charges from earlier in the day. Uh, the individual then fled officers uh, across the street and we come up with a situation that I think is uh, very problematic for our officers. Uh, we end up with four officers, uh, a supervisor, well within what we're being asked to do under our settlement agreement, two less lethal, two lethal, and a supervisor to supervise the scene. And they're trying to negotiate with this individual at two o'clock in the morning on the side of, the, of a building downtown uh, and the individual lunges at officers uh, officers discharged their firearm and less lethal and the individual died as a result of the gunshot wounds he sustained. Um, the officers, of course, will be put on standard leave and uh, we will be uh, investigating this through a multi-agency task force. 
and we remind the public that we have a DOJ approved uh, process. Yesterday our monitor's report came out, highest rating we've had in compliance uh, since the beginning of this process once again. And that officers do have a due process and in order for us to hold people accountable, we have to let the due process take its course, the case be investigated internally, and then the, the results will either determine uh, what was in policy or not out of policy, what actions need to be taken. So uh, yesterday's shooting is just a, a grim reminder that you know we need to work uh, with our state legislator, we need to work with our partners in the criminal justice system. We have to find answers. We have to find answers as to how we can reduce the number of contacts with these individuals and when we do have them in a secure facility like a detention center, how we get them to resources uh, and make sure that they're getting everything they need rather than us trying to deal with them two in the morning uh, outside of uh, the downtown police station. So uh, this case is still under review and will continue to be under review. And throughout this, we'll be plugging in these three areas of, of concern and uh, talking about how we can work as a community. The reason we're doing this today is I was here in 2014, and I firsthand saw what uh, strain between the community and the police department brought. A lot of that strain was revolving around officer-involved shootings, and we're going to be upfront, transparent, and honest with what the true uh, statistics are, what we are seeing, and educate the community as much as possible uh, to ensure that uh, they have an understanding of what we have in process how far we've come under our DOJ process and uh, in cases, in some cases that we have had to hold officers accountable uh, and uh, they were appropriately dealt with and uh, we continue to want to move forward uh, working with the community on these issues. So at this point I'm going to turn it over to uh, Gilbert and he's going to go through some of the, the issues that we're seeing and some of the statistics that we've developed. Thank you, Chief. So we have this slide up here that we put together yesterday just with some recent headlines around the nation. Um, and it's, I want to remind you that probably the beginning of this year, maybe January, February, Chief predicted that we were probably going to see more officer-involved shootings based on conversations with chiefs from around the country. And they were seeing upticks everywhere else. So, you know, same with homicides and a lot of the violent crime trends. Um, we have, in fact, seen a lot more officer-involved shootings. So. Um, and we, we were just at the conference in Dallas and talked about all these different things, the overdoses, the gun crimes, the suicides by guns, um, homicides, officer-involved shootings. And the big thing in Dallas was the shooting at officers and officers getting shot. I think we had two chiefs who had to leave the conference early because they had officers who got shot in their jurisdiction. So it was heavy on the minds of everyone at that conference. And, uh, and I just want to kind of bring that up that this isn't, isn't just happening here. Uh, we just learned this morning that this today's OIS is the 50th in New Mexico, is what state police told us this morning. So it's not even just Albuquerque, it's happening all around the state for a variety of reasons. So with that, I'll just kind of get going with the presentation. Um, obviously, obviously, this is dated by a couple of days. Um, so we've had 53 officer-involved shootings from 2018 to currently, and that actually goes up to 54 if you count last night's. Um, so that's over five years. Of those, 29 were fatal, 24 were non-fatal. 85% um, of the, the, and I'm gonna refer to the OIS, the individuals as subjects, they're not an offender, or they're not a victim necessary, it's, but I'm gonna refer to them as subjects. 85% of them uh, had a firearm or an apparent firearm. And what I mean by that is in some cases they had a BB gun or an airsoft gun, but it was made to look like a gun. Um, and then 67% of those uh, fired their gun either prior or during the incident with officers. Um, uh, another interesting statistic is out of the, there were 83 officers involved in those 53 incidents and 75% had no prior officer involved shootings. Um, So these are just a couple of graphs splitting that up and you could see it by year 2018 through 2022 and obviously um, this year we shot up and now it should be 17 and 10 fatal OISs. And this just breaks up if you take the non-fatal ones you can see which ones involved injuries where a person was shot and those where there were no injuries at all and nobody was shot but we still investigate that as an officer involved shooting. 
Um, looking at, is it actually in the area command? Yeah. Um, looking at by area command, we were just talking about this before. This, this is one of the interesting ones in that, um, so I have zero for the, the Southwest area command. Chief just proved me wrong. He said there was one and he remembered it. So I'll have to dig that out and change that. But it's interesting because as opposed to homicides, which are primarily you know, in three area commands, I would say Southeast, um, Valley and Southwest, and then you'll get some in, in different er other area commands. These are pretty spread apart. Um, and then they're kind of different by year. This year we've had half of our officer involved shootings have been in the foothills. Um, at, with that, that big number, most of them have, half have been in the foothills. So it's, you know, I, I don't, I can't really explain it. I don't know if Chief has any thoughts about it. Um, but it's, you know, I think it's just the, the different situations officers are put in with individuals. It isn't necessarily an area where like a drug crime is being committed or, you know, or what, what you might have in the Southeast or some of the other areas, but, but they are spread out a little more around the city. You know, one of the things I would, I would characterize with the interest in foothills is if you look at our foothills shootings and you think about them in the past, you know, several of them have been, uh, you know, an individual going through a mental health crisis. We had the individual off of uh, Tramway who was actually a murder suspect uh, that was obviously going through some kind of mental health crisis, ended up killing and shooting some other individuals and ended up losing their life uh, during and the For us to continue to work is like, I don't want there to be this perception that the officers are out there just uh, being involved in excessive force when they don't have to. Uh, you know, the data showing our officers are encountering more and more armed subjects on a daily basis. Uh, we reduced crime stats yesterday. The category that went up, firearm violations. So there is an abundance of firearms in the community, and uh, we do have uh, these firearms that are leading to these incidents where uh, we're having officer involved shootings. And I think it's directly impacted also our homicides. Yeah, that does track. Even with the increase in homicides, the percentage of those involving uh, guns has gone up from like 70% to 80%. And for a while of this year, it was up to 90%. I think it's dropped down to maybe 85%. So just the, the firearm involved in homicides and these crimes is, continues to go up. Um, next slide, just a little bit more about the guns. So we said 85% had firearms. Um, 30 of those 45% fired those firearms. Uh, and then 14 did not fire any. So the this is a look at, at drugs and alcohol and their involvement with officer-involved shootings. Um, I don't know if any of you were here. A couple years ago, we had a press conference looking specifically at meth and its involvement with officer-involved shootings. The I think Mr. Cox, was he the special prosecutor who reviews a lot of officer-involved shootings, did a study the last decade finding that as much as 80% of officer-involved shootings, the subject had meth in their system, looking at the autopsy reports. We looked at them further and we're finding the same things kind of going up. The one thing with the toxicology reports are take so long to get through that we just, it takes a while to, to find us out, but we continue to see this trend over and over. Um, so if you look at the types of drugs and alcohol, um, out of the 53 OIS incidents, 18 use drugs, 12 use alcohol, uh, two no drugs or alcohol, and then 21, 22 are unknown. And it's unknown either because it's still under investigation or we don't have toxicology reports back, or uh, the vast majority of those who were not injured or did not die, we're just, we're probably never gonna know whether they were using drugs or alcohol or nothing at all. Um, you know, I think it's important to note, like we talked about this, that, you know, each shooting equals about 2% of, of what's up here. So you're, we're looking at this and when we're talking about 53 total OISs, we have a portion, about 21 that we don't know uh, or we don't have information. But there are only two officer involved shootings that we know of that the individual was not under the influence of some kind of drug or alcohol. And that's key. And it is key to understanding that people are making irrational decisions and our officers are having to deal with it because they're under the influence. And it's sometimes very hard for individuals, uh, especially the families, because we know that there's a grieving family left behind. But so many times it's hard for them to comprehend why did our loved one do this? And I just want them to just kind of remember that you know, maybe their loved one wasn't under the right frame of mind. We've all been around intoxicated people, people who are on drugs, and their reasoning and their thought process is not uh, what it needs to be. That's why we have laws about driving, not driving while you're under these influences. So, 
as, as difficult as we know it is and as much as families suffer, I think there could be a little bit of reassurance to them knowing that, you know, your loved one may have not made the best decision based off of, of the stage that they were under. And, and we're only showing two right now where some, they weren't under some kind of influence. So this is a look just at the toxicology reports, those that we have. So we, out of 28 fatal shootings, we've, we have a total of 19 toxicology reports. And as he was saying, 17 showed alcohol or drugs and two showed no alcohol or drugs. The next slide just gets into a little bit more. So 16 cases with, uh, with meth in their system, uh, 13 with alcohol, then it goes down. You know, some with, with uh, marijuana, cocaine, amphetamine. Uh, one of the interesting things is fentanyl, since fentanyl has kind of coming in the community over the last couple of years, and we're seeing it so often in a, in a variety of ways. Um, you know, I thought we might see it more in some of these cases, but either it just hasn't reached that point, so we, since we don't have toxicology reports for this past year, or I don't know, I don't know if it has the same effects. We had um, doctors and we had our CIT folks talk to us about the effects of meth and how paranoid people tend to be on meth and they think someone's after them anyway, you know, prior to something like this, but I'm not sure if fentanyl, I think it has a similar effect, but I'm not, I'm not really an expert on that. Um, so we'll see in the coming year what this year's toxicology reports show. Um, and this is just a look at a OS by day of the week. Um, it's just, I don't know if it's interesting or not, but Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, um, what was yesterday it was a, a Wednesday, so our Wednesday will go up. I still find the shocking Fridays are one of our busiest days in patrolling in the field. That's one of our lowest days of the week. Yeah. And same by time of day, so um, that's pretty evenly spread out. I'm kind of shocked that most of them happen in the afternoon. It seems to us like it, they happen overnight. <laughs> it's because we have to get up and go overnight, but um, yeah, I don't know if there's any rhyme or reason for that. So these next slides are going to go over the, the race and ethnicity of, we're going to look at the subjects involved in, in these OISs as well as the officers. And I'm com you'll see in the next slide, I think, that, that they're compared to, um, I tried comparing them to homicide, both offenders and victims, and, and, and they're different. I think victims are a little more like they, uh, an OIS subject, if you, if you look at there. So 57% are Hispanic, 26% white. Uh, seven percent American Indian. I think. I think American Indians tend to be more involved um, as a subject of an OIS. Oh, no, I'm sorry. More as a homicide victim. I think. So they're not actually not that. That I guess that was a surprising thing. So American Indians, uh, black individuals. I think we've had one multiracial um, are pretty low. If you can, it's almost all Hispanic and, and white. And then somewhat comparable to homicide victims and offenders. If you want to go to the next one for victims, and that's a slide I was just thinking about. They're, they, they're pretty similar. So this was the, you go this way, yeah. So this is a look at officers in the force. And I, I should have looked at our, the percentage of the actual sworn officers. But this is those involved in the OISs. So what is that? 57%? So this kind of flips. It's 57% white and 39% Hispanic. I think that's reflective of what our, our force looks like, but it's not as reflective of what the community looks like. Um, and we've seen that in other communities as well. And one of the reasons we work on diversity and, and trying to get more Hispanics, Blacks, Native Americans um, hired as officers, Asians. Um, you know, and, and one thing that, you know, if you go back two slides and you show the, the, the ethnicity of the individuals involved in the shooting, you know, I think this is where we will continue to work with our ambassador program. Like we know that we potentially have uh, re uh, strained relationships and that we have to work more with the Hispanic community right now. We do have a relationship with, with various groups in there. Uh, we have to continue to make sure that we have outreach because, like I said, the last thing I want is us to get back to where we were in 2014 and people have unanswered questions and they feel like they are uh, the victims of police violence. So we know th this kind of helps us determine, like, 
Where do we have to continue to put resources into? Where do we have to make sure that we're doing as much outreach as possible and working with those various communities? Like, we're going to work with every community, but I, particularly we know that we have to put some work into this community. You know, go to subject by age. So th this is interesting as well. If you look at uh, the subjects of an OIS, uh, most of them are the 26 to 35 year range. And what's interesting is the, the teenager and 18 to 25 are pretty low, definitely compared to homicides, they're very low. Um, and then you tend to have on, on older groups that are also the subject of an officer involved shooting. Um, I think that's one unique thing to officer involved shootings. I've seen in other areas of the country where you know we hear a lot about kind of middle-aged white males tend to be involved in an officer involved shooting. Um, but, th but this is pretty interesting, I think. Uh, you know, and I think the important thing to realize here is, like, what, what is being done well here? And, you know, I want to compliment. We have so much, so many studies. We have specialty courts like young adult court and all these other uh, processes that we have working in place. And, you know, I, th I think this is a great example of why, you know, we have a lower number here. We know that this is a bigger at-risk age group. We know that we have had studies that say, 18 to 25 is an age group that, you know, people are really at that crossroad where they could make poor decisions and that the whole goal is to get into 25. I think we need to look at this as a community and realize, like, you know, maybe we need to expand the time frames of where we're looking at individuals at those crucial ages and start devoting resources to 25, uh, 26 to 35 year olds to see if we could get this number going down kind of like we do at the 18 to 25. Because we do have extensive resources, there's studies, Everything is saying we put a lot of resources into this age group. We need to kind of shift some of those resources to an older age group. And I think that 2% down there is, represents one 15-year-old, uh, right, from earlier this year, if you guys remember on the west side. So this next slide, just, this one looks at, compares it to homicide offender, and you kind of see that phenomenon I'm talking about. Uh, homicide offenders tend to be 18 to 25-year-olds. Um, and then there's a fair amount of, of teenagers, 17 and under. Um, and then a fair amount of 26 to 35, but it is a different dynamic than we see with OIS subjects. And the next slide looks at homicide, compares it to homicide. Is it the same thing? Yeah, I, I just had the wrong, this should be victims, I think. I just had the wrong title. So, pretty similar. Um, and then the other, Maybe it's not shocking, but I think about every single uh, subject of an officer involved shooting has been male. So out of 53, now 54, um, every single one has been a male. Um, I think, I want to say, I've looked at other cities and I, you know, it's kind of mixed. I know we, I could think of one female subject from before we started, a couple of years that was, uh, got a lot of publicity. Um, and just looking at, Again, looking at homicide. So homicide offenders tends to be predominantly male, uh, but there's 12% female for homicides. Uh, and then this, again, should be victim. So victim is, uh, females are a little more likely to be a victim of a homicide than, than an offender. Uh, and then the officer gender as well. Um, 96% male, uh, only four female officers have been involved in officer involved shooting. And I want to say that was only in two different incidents back in 2018 when we first started. But ever since then, we haven't had any female officers involved. Um, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, I looked at officer experience at the time, just how many years they have on the force. Usually when we have a presentation, we'll say when they started. So. 22 are the two, the two biggest ones, had two, between two and three years of experience, and then it kind of just runs a gamut through for the rest of the time. So there, there tend to be a lot of young officers. You know, and I think the, the thing to remember here is that uh, this large group makes up a large portion of our field services, which are our uniformed officers. They haven't had time to go to specialized units. They're newer, they're still working in the field. One of the things I want to help to remember is like, these officers, uh, we feel, in a lot of ways, we feel very comfortable because they've been trained to the new standards under our settlement agreement with the Department of Justice, and they've received some of the most updated advanced training and uh, 
And, and I think that's going to reflect through the slide that we're about to see in terms of uh, misconduct and, and how uh, we uh, have, have seen our officer-involved shootings and how uh, we've, where there has been issues, how uh, even though this larger group, uh, this is a larger group that it, I don't think it doesn't necessarily reflect the discipline. Um, so this is a look at the officers with prior officer-involved shooting incidents. As I said at the beginning, 75% had no prior. This was their first officer-involved shooting. 16% um, had one prior and 9%, which seems to me a pretty small amount. So it's probably like four or five individuals who had um, two or more prior OISs. And I think, I mean, significantly, I think, and I don't know what it was before our time here, but I remember in the monitors or the DOJ investigation, they really highlighted a lot of individuals who had multiple officer-involved shootings um, and it seemed like nothing was done. But maybe Chief wants to talk about what, what we've done when we see this happen. You know, one of the things here is uh, we have a great officer wellness program and we've actually had officers who've been involved in multiple shootings who asked to leave the field or go to another unit. And this 9% is gonna be made up primarily of three units. And they're the units that deal with the most difficult, dangerous situations. Our tactical section uh, and members from our, our uh, investigative uh, support unit, uh, ISU, that are out looking for the most violent of offenders that are gonna make up this largest portion all uh, within the 9%. So we're gonna kind of shift and look at our investigations um, of officers and the OIS incidents. And um, just a reminder of how the process works. So we have an, uh, a criminal investigation that takes place by the multi-agency task force. And, and I do want to get, just recognize those detectives and investigators and the crime lab. Uh, we were out this morning again and, uh, you know, Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office, State Police, APD, and these guys are, you know, just top notch um, and put a lot, a lot of time and effort into these criminal investigations. So they work on that report over several months and forward their report to the district attorney's office and they decide whether any charges are merited. Uh, but at the same time, we also have, and we always say this when we do these presentations, we have administrative investigations. So that's done internally through our, our force division, our internal affairs, and uh, our uh, deputy director, <laughs> uh, Zach Cottrell, is gonna talk a little bit about it. I'll go through the couple slides real quick, but he can tell you how that process works. But he gave me some statistics, but if you look at these, out of all the 53, uh, except for those that haven't been investigated yet, 83% were found to be in policy, 6% were found to be out of policy, which is I think three incidents, and then 11% are still under investigation. You know, I think if you go back to the, the, the big thing to remember here is like, we have a 12% unknown, we have a 6% we know is out of policy. And we have to have realistic standards. Like we have very high standards under our settlement agreement. And our settlement agreement's goal has always been 95%. 95% of everything we do, we want to be within policy. So if you look, this is very similar to what we're seeing across the board recently, and, and uh, uh, Deputy Director Cottrell can talk a little bit about that. We just talked about how our use of force uh, policy uh, has, has go shown that we're about six and a half to seven percent of the time that it's not in policy, 93% of the time, and we've raised it to that point. It's very similar with our uh, deadly force that's used in our officer involved shooting. So in, in, in the grand scheme of things, we're looking like we want this 5% or lower. Obviously, we want it zero, but we want this 5% or lower in order to meet the requirements of our settlement agreement. And I think yesterday's settlement uh, DOJ report really highlights the success and how we're moving in the right direction with this. The, the other part of that is I, I think it gets lost when there's during the media attention on these shootings is the I think the public may misunderstand and think that every shooting is, is a deadly force incident and out of policy or, or, or a, an excessive use of force, which isn't the case at all. This is what this looks at and looks at if we're in policy, that means that you know they follow those standards um, set by the department. Um, and just the other part of that, so when, the, we, when they do these investigations, Zach talked about it, they also look at officer misconduct. So if there's allegations of officer misconduct in any fashion they look at those as well and I was kind of surprised looking at the whole thing anyone involved so supervisors who are not even involved in the use of force there there might be allegations of misconduct like not using their OBRD uh, during the investigation or other kind of things going on so they, they look at 
you know, all those sorts of things. So if you go to the next slide, um, if you look at those officer misconduct, they investigated 15 allegations of misconduct by officers involved in deadly force. So these, these are just the officers who were involved. Um, they also investigated allegations of misconduct by officers and supervisors who were not involved, which I just explained. And then we have six cases still under investigation for misconduct. And then these are just the types of misconduct. So it goes anything from deadly force. Uh, we had instances with deadly force in motor vehicles um, where, we're, where some of our policy violations occurred. Uh, duty to provide medical attention and transportation. Response to behavioral health issues. Use of force prohibitions. Um, room cl clearing fundamentals. There was one instance, I think, I think our very first one in 2018 involved a clearing a room and someone had a knife. Um, so I think those officers had to be trained a little more. Uh, using on-body recording devices, obviously, uh, duties of personnel and reporting uh, for duty. And then this slide looks at the discipline that resulted from the investigations. So we said there were three out-of-policy officer-involved shootings. Out of those, uh, those resulted in two terminations of officers, uh, one suspension, five letters of reprimand, three verbal reprimands, and six instances of additional training. And then before Zach comes up, I'll just give you the, the final slide. This is just a look at uh, legal action resulting from officer hall shootings. Obviously, I think when the DOJ came in, um, you know, I remember at that time, the city was paying out tens of millions of dollars for a lot of these cases and, and settlements and judgments. Um, so far, uh, 36 of the 53 cases have resulted in no illegal action. There are 11 pending tort claims, which could result in lawsuits. We have four pending lawsuits. We've had one uh, settlement so far, and then one ruling in the city's favor, but that could be appealed still. So with that, I'll just ask Zach to come up and just talk a little bit more about the administrative side. Good morning, I'm Deputy Director Zach Cottrell. Um, like Chief talked about, we also, in, in addition to the criminal investigation done by the multi-agency task force, we also do an administrative review, which is done within our Internal Affairs Force Division. Um, they review every actual application of force, um, especially involving officer-involved shootings. Um, it's important to remember that our use of force policy is actually more strict than what federal law requires us to have. Um, so when we are looking at these officer-involved shootings, we're actually comparing them to our very strict use of force policy. Um, as Gilbert was talking about those policy violations that we've come up through, um, investigations done by our Internal Affairs Force Division. Those potential policy violations are then referred to our Internal Affairs Division. Um, within Internal Affairs, they then compare those potential policy violations to policy to see if the officers involved did violate the policy. Uh, it's very important to remember that just because there's a policy violation in the use of force, it does not make that use of force out of policy. Um, as Gilbert talked about, it can range from anywhere from not activating their on-body recording device immediately upon getting to a scene, um, to not uploading when they're supposed to, um, to not rendering aid or transporting individuals correctly, handcuffed correctly, stuff like that. Um, so most of those policy violations that we have seen in the last four years out of officer-involved shootings have been minor instances. Um, I think the, the graph that they put up showing the discipline that was given out um, in relation to officer-involved shootings is mostly minor violations, um, most of them been OBRD when I went back through them. Um, Gilbert talked about the two that were um, terminated. Um, I think that shows that the department is investigating these internally very thoroughly, um, taking it very seriously, um, applying our use of force policies the way that we're supposed to, especially considering we're under the Department of Justice consent decree. Um, but it's also important that we also look for trends in these shootings. Um, we take training not only for one individual involved in the shooting, or if we start seeing trends, we incorporate that training department-wide. Um, every year we're required to do 40 hours of use of force training for every officer on this department. So we take a lot of what we learn from these force investigations, incorporate that into training, so that year to year, hopefully our training is getting better, our officers are more equipped, better equipped, and arrive on these scenes um, in a better state of mind. I think Chief talked about the shooting last night. I think that's a perfect example of how we've progressed as a department. Two officers had their less lethal option ready and two officers had lethal option ready. Um, there was a supervisor on scene running the scene. 
Um, and that's exactly how our training has evolved over the last few years. So there were options available to those officers so that when they were presented with a deadly threat, they could react appropriately. Um, obviously, that's still under investigation. We'll, we'll do the you know, administrative review of that through force, um, and any policy violations will be investigated within internal affairs. Um, so I'll have to work. Okay. You know, and uh, I, I, I'm anxiously awaiting the results of last night's officer-involved shooting because one of the things that we have learned through the processes we have is to identify gaps or problems, whether it's in policy or training. And we did have a shooting at a bus stop of the U-Bank a couple years ago that uh, was controversial at the time. Individual had a, a airsoft gun. Based off of that review, uh, we recognize that we should train our officers more about the seven critical tasks, make sure that perimeters are being started, supervisors on scene. So we formulated a whole training regiment based off of this information. And, you know, we talked about it in the last officer involved shooting. Uh, there's a lot of concern with our policy on how it's written for passive aggressive individuals. And we talked about the Tenorio shooting on on San Mateo where, you know, that person was passive resistant and we were unable to deploy less lethal. And based off of that, Commander uh, Deputy Director Cottrell is working to modify that uh, policy so that these individuals who are armed in certain circumstances, the totality of the situation would allow us to use less lethal on some of these individuals that are, are could be considered passive resistant. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, waiting to see if last night we would have had the opportunity uh, to uh, utilize a less lethal on this individual had he been passive resistant uh, to see if it truly is a trend and we could have reduced that shooting if our policy could be reeled back a little. So there's a lot to learn. And, you know, in closing, I want to say that, you know, I know families are impacted. They're changed forever. I am consistently meet with uh, victims of homicides. Last night I met with and spoke to a group of uh, victims of homicide and uh, the families become lifelong friends to the department and the people who work with them. So I know the families are impacted. I know it's, it's a big burden on them. Uh, I also know that uh, there's great risk, liability to the city and, and the taxpayers of this of this city, but also to the integrity and trust that the community has with the Albuquerque Police Department. But I don't want to leave out the fact that this also impacts our officers. I was involved in a shooting early in my career, and uh, I can tell you that it probably only is in the last four years that I could discuss that situation without... Uh, getting emotional about it and i think that uh even when i took over as chief i sat with somebody in this room and we had a conversation about that and it still bothered me and i think that we got to remember that our officers also carry this forever so i'm hoping that we could reflect back at the beginning of this uh press conference and think about those three issues that we spoke about and how we could work with our community and how we could get all the partners to the table we have to find a better way to deal with individuals who are under a mental health crisis we just simply can't have them released from jail because uh, they're not competent. We have to release them into resources, and we need to make sure as a community we have those resources. And, you know, I don't believe it's the police department's job to put these cases together in front of the courts, but I'm committed to lower officer-involved shootings and lower violence in this community. And if the Albuquerque Police Department has to seek the funding to do this job because there's nobody else who can do it, the community has my commitment that we'll move in that direction. And we actually already started some, some groundwork on, on a pilot project where we want to do this because we simply cannot have our officers trying to count. We can't count on our officers de-escalating every situation at 2 in the morning with an individual who is already in safety. And I'm asking the advocates out there that have focused so much on the homeless that for a moment, take a step back. Realize that the police department is taking the right steps in the right direction. Work with us and help us advocate for the proper resources for your clients to get the help that they need. Oh, somebody's. Somebody just went dead. It's fixed. Let that turn back on. Do you mind hitting the on buttons? Is it on? Yeah. See, that's quick reaction. No, for us to continue to work together to get people the help that they need. This isn't about pointing fingers at one another. This is about working together. How do we make sure that people get the help that they need? Because this process of just releasing people back into the community, and we're not pointing fingers at anybody, the DA's office, the public defenders, the courts. This is about, it's a difficult task and an understanding of who is responsible for these individuals. If we need to bring in the health department, let's bring them in. But we can take a big chunk out of that 
And in terms of individuals under uh, uh, the influence, we need stronger penalties and we need to deter people from going out with their firearms when they're under the influence. So I think there's a lot of things we could do as a community and I just don't want it lost that these officer involved shootings and the data and the statistics we talked today do have uh, families that are left behind grieving, do affect our officers and do have an impact on uh, the community relationships for the Albuquerque Police Department. And that's why we're here today to be as transparent and talk about this issue and get it out in front of the public so that they have true information and know exactly what uh, we're talking about and where uh, we're trying to uh, present some of this data to, to the public to uh, be able to know and be educated on the topic. Questions? Any questions? Yeah, you mentioned the homeless. Uh, I guess what percentage of these are, are there statistics on how many of uh, these officer involved shootings involve um, subjects, who are, subjects who are unhoused? It's a great question, and if we don't have it, we will be trying to figure it out. It's Yeah, it's kind of tough to figure out, but uh, I, we have, I've noticed a lot this year on homicides, uh, victims and offenders, more so than in the past, and that's one of the things I want to kind of figure out as well. That's a great idea, and we're going to look into that. Because I'm really, I, I really wholeheartedly believe that as our unhoused population has grown, that's kind of reflective to some of our violent crime problems that we're seeing within the city. And then, of course, you mentioned uh, there were 53 <coughs> officer involved shootings uh, as of 2018. How many have been just this year? This year, we were at 17. Does that include the one last night? Yes. Okay. Yes, Elise. Um, in the beginning, you talked about like the three groups of can you give us a breakdown of how many are in each group? I don't have that immediately with me, and some may cross over, but we'll, we'll work on getting you those numbers. Because you got to remember, we're going to have some individuals that it's really unknown, and, and I could think of two right off the back. Uh, the individual off of tramway this year with the cell phone. That individual is possibly under the influence of uh, alcohol, but at the same time, we know that he has a mental health history. So it, we may not be able to just pin it to one of those three issues. It's also difficult, I think. I couldn't figure out a way to, to determine if there's a mental health issue. Um, it's not shown in a toxicology report or, you know, in some cases maybe it was known during the investigation, but that's a really difficult one. It, it, and it's very subjective because we're going to have to just look at their actions and say it's obvious. Like the individual second essential who drove up to the officers, and in our opinion, it was a suicide by cop where he pulled out the gun and had been driving around. So there is, uh, it, it's very difficult to pin an exact, but I think we could try to find something to that extent. I guess what I'm getting at is the difference between someone like the man that you just mentioned um, on Tramway and somebody who, like Kashawn Thomas, who, um, and possibly the one over the weekend, um, I talked to some family members, like someone who's just kind of drunk in their car, they pick up a gun, and then they get killed. That's very different from someone who was pointing a cell phone, but saying that they were going to shoot people. So see, and I, those categories? I think those are two very distinct categories that we're trying to explain. And those are two perfect cases. Like to me, those are two individual cases where alcohol was definitely a factor and there were some, some decisions made by individuals that was costly. And we're actually planning a media campaign on this. Like we have to educate the community. Like I see no good coming from an individual who, who is intoxicated and picks up a firearm in the presence of an officer without communication. It, it's going to be very difficult because things are going to occur so fast and decisions are going to have to be made. And one of the things I talked about is Gilbert is like, we have to educate the community. The community has to understand that if you do have a firearm in your car, we just need you to tell the officer. We don't want you to try to recover it and hand it to the officer. But at the same time, there has to be strong communication, but there still is that concern when somebody is in that state of mind, are they going to be able to comprehend and make that right decision? And, and that's something that we're going to have to struggle with. And that's why I think increasing penalties along with the community education is key because we have to make it, we have to have some kind of deterrence. Leave your gun at home. Don't take it with you if you plan to go out and drink. It's legal to have a gun in your car. It's yes. Drink. People are always going to drink, it seems like. Um, yes. What about like education from the officer side? Like how much of a threat is someone <coughs> who's, you know, very drunk and just picks up a gun? You know, I'll propose this question back to the media. Would anybody like me to give a firearm to a drunk person and have you stand in front of them and make the decision that you're not going to do yeah, anything about it? The but see, the, but know. there, but there, but at least we have to remember there is no training. And, and we'll ask uh, Zach to jump in here with policy questions. But 
is there realistically a training where we could train officers to know and understand what somebody who is intoxicated thought process is? I think if we could develop that training, if anybody could give us a national model or a program that has that type of training, we're more than open and we will adopt it immediately uh, once we get it through the DOJ process. But there is no training that says you can predict somebody's behavior who is under the influence of alcohol and officers and, and it gives them time. I think that's a situation where we have to let the cases take its course through force review board and we have to determine is there policy or training outside of trying to predict that person's behavior that we could modify to reduce the likelihood of us having to use uh, deadly force. And I've said this before with the DOJ process. The DOJ process missed one huge aspect in all this. Everybody missed it and I've been very critical about this. They missed the process of complete disengagement. And there are times when maybe there is a disengagement that needs to occur. They wrote in very well de-escalation. And this is why I think it's important that these processes have uh, individuals who are currently involved with law enforcement and seeing the trends that are occurring because this is something we need to figure out still as a department. When are we going to disengage? But we're not at that point right now. And we're working so hard on other aspects of de-escalation and training. And I'm hoping that we could eventually in the near future have the time carved out to be able to advance our training and be one of the first departments that have that disengagement and that we're able to utilize that training for situations like that. Disengagement, like you go to a scene and you decide to just... Then you decide that you either retreat or that, that in some circumstances you retreat or in some circumstances uh, the individual is, uh, is uh, let go. I mean, we have it in one aspect. Uh, think of 2009 to 14 and all the officer involved shootings with suicidal barricaded subjects. What do we do with those subjects now? We don't have those shootings. Why? We disengage and we get away. But it's only covered in that one process. And maybe we have to look at it as a bigger process. And with over 50% uh, of these subjects involved in the officer involved shootings, uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned being Hispanic men, I guess, how does the department go to uh, work to kind of reduce that? Or you mentioned kind of working with the Hispanic community. You know, I think that's where. Uh, having the foundations of an ambassador program is so important and us being able to reach out and start educating that portion of the community. And this community education that me and Gilbert have been talking about that we want to push out, that's where we're going to utilize the ambassador program to start getting the word out uh, to different communities and different groups and say, look, you know, culturally, we if this is a cultural issue, we got to stop uh, doing this. I'll, I'll be honest, I'm a Hispanic male. I grew up in a small town and there was nowhere I went uh, growing up that you didn't have a hunting rifle with you. I grew up hunting and fishing. And, uh, you know, sometimes maybe we need to remind people that there are circumstances where you shouldn't be going out if you're going to be conducting certain activities. Or if you decide to start drinking, what are some appropriate options people could think about to safeguard themselves and secure the weapon in the trunk, separate it from its ammunition, take it out of the, the front of the car or a council, beforehand and put it somewhere else. So I think there's a lot of things that we still need to discuss. And I just want to be really open and, and I also want to really invite the community and the media. Like Elise had a great question like, what can our officers have done differently? And we're saying that there is no training space for that. If somebody knows of a training uh, or something that another agency is doing to deal with any of these specific uh, situations that could have reduced the likelihood of a, of a deadly force encounter, we are all ears in wanting to work with the Albuquerque Police Department. And I know that this is a great room for resources and each one of you will go back and you know you will do the Google searches and see what other agencies are doing. If there's an idea that we need to implement at the Albuquerque Police Department, that's part of who we want to become and the culture we want to have here. We want to listen and work with the community. So get us that information and uh, maybe as a together as a group with the media, we could find an answer to, to, a, to something that we're, we're trying to solve uh, or an issue that we're trying to solve in the community and how we're policing the city of Albuquerque. Chief, is 17 the most OAS as you guys have had in a year? Yes, 17 is uh, higher than even pre-DOJ numbers. Why do you think there's that increase? I mean, you go from 10, 8, 10, 9 to now 17, and we're not done with here. Any idea why there's an increase of that? I think it's related to where we are as a country and where we are as a society right now coming out of the pandemic. I would love for somebody to do a study to show the impacts on the pandemic and how it's affecting society now. 
if you look at how it's affected, uh, we've there's been numerous studies about the increase in suicides. Nationwide, we're seeing an increase in homicides. And we know that a lot of times, it's either one or the other. You're either going to uh, react externally through a homicide or a possible officer involved shooting, or you're going to react internally through suicide or suicide by cops. So I think that given that those two categories are seeing increases nationwide uh, and that we're seeing it at a level never before, I think that's directly attributing to uh, the, the, the increase in officer involved shootings. And you have to also look, there are more firearms sold during the pandemic than probably any other period of time within this country. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but I'm saying that we have individuals who may not have been responsible and didn't have a firearm before that now felt that during that time frame they wanted to be armed and they just maybe don't understand uh, some of the things that potentially could go wrong with that. And that's why this aspect of community education is so important for us. And you said these OAS has come from three main units in your department, correct? No, I said that the ones involved in multiple OISs come basically from two main uh, units, and that and those ones with multiple shootings, the officers, it's going to come from our tactical section and our uh, investigative uh, services unit. So for the most part, it's been officers, patrol officers. Yeah, like patrol do. officers by far involved in in the most officer involved shootings. Yes, um, I noticed up there statistics when it said APD workforce. There wasn't a uh, category for Black. There is there is no explanation or logic to it. One of the things we, we want to do and that we actually just started in the last two weeks is we're start trying to start a mentorship program uh, with the black community to increase uh, the membership of the black community within the Albuquerque Police Department. We are working with local uh, leaders from the black community and with Office of Equity and Inclusion and our goal is to pair a mentor uh, with an applicant and hope that that mentor can help get that applicant through the process. We're not even trying to look at when they're already in the system. We want to offer a mentor as they start going into the application process to hopefully walk and increase our, our membership within the police department. And that graph was uh, no African American officers involved in an officer involved shooting. Uh, I could get you the percentages. Yeah. Of we could get you the percentage on the other. It's not very high, but it. <coughs> it does. Any other questions? Yes, Elise. Um, so, with the toxicology reports, um, is that anyone who had anything in the system, or like that they were high at the time, or drunk at the time that this is happening? Like, are you differentiating between someone who has used meth two days earlier and still has it in their system, or someone who's using meth? Um, I think it's just if they had it at the time. But that's the not necessarily time. people who are actively using when they were high. I don't think that would be no, new. It was in their system. I think alcohol would be a good one to say it was actively in their system because it only stays in the system a certain period of time. There are some drugs that are in the system shorter periods of time than other. When I saw the ones that indicated that they were on marijuana, I was like, yeah, that could be like four weeks, six weeks, whatever the time frame is. So I think you'd have to look at the drug categories. Uh, individually and see how long that the drug is in their system uh, uh, and could be detected by a toxicology. And my last question is about the out of policy um, two days. There was a t period of time where the investigations were not very good. That was heavily criticized a couple of years ago by the monitor. Um, so do you trust that those were the only ones that are out of policy? Have they been looked at by the Policy Review Board and by other people? Can we trust that? I am going to let Zach hit this one because he knows that way better than me. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Don't forget that we still have the external force investigation team here on site reviewing every investigation that comes out of our internal affairs force division. But that's it, recent then. That's they the last two years. Yeah, but have they looked at the ones between 28? They have not. We're going through those now in the backlog. They're actually doing those investigations for us. Um, they're currently, they started with the officer involved shootings first. They're going through those first that they're gonna look at high incident officers next. Um, so they're going through those officer involved shootings now. Um, also, the independent monitoring team looks at every force investigation done on officer involved shooting to include the misconduct that comes out of internal affairs. <coughs> um, when we get data requests from the monitor, that's the first thing they ask for, any out of policy use of force and a subsequent misconduct investigation out of it. So that's getting reviewed by them. Um, and we were criticized for our internal affairs in investigations, um, you know, up to, you know, 2018. Um, 
if you read the monitor's report that came out yesterday, um, everything with internal affairs is within compliance. Um, they trust our investigations now. Um, they've said they're complete, thorough, and that our findings are, um, are adequate. So I think we can trust our findings. I will say that there still are a few OISs that are in that backlog um, that were, you know, 467 cases, something like that, that did not get investigated, um, that we did, you know, contract out to another um, external force investigation team to come and do those investigations now. They are going through those first. Um, we'll have better data on those probably in the next few months from them. Um, their, their quarterly report's gonna come out in about a month um, that we'll have to file with the court um, under the Department of Justice consent decree. But as those backlog investigations get done, we will, I mean, it's possible we'll see a couple more out of policy in those cases as well. That's a good question. And I just wanted to introduce to uh, Mr. Valdez, our new superintendent, uh, Mr. Form, is, is here with us in case you haven't met him before. But I just wanted to introduce him. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, I have a question, but it's not related to this. Um, do you guys by any chance have any information on the 18 burglary that happened over at Loma Bonita over on the southeast side? No, but we will have somebody track that one down. Okay. Hang out a second afterwards and we'll get the right. We'll, okay. we'll figure out contact and we'll get back to you. Okay. Any other questions? So I want to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, I think it was a great, I like the questions, the discussions. I've always said it. I like questions. It helps us. I'll clarify things that we may not be thinking of. So thank you. And if anybody comes across ideas, I mean, this is about us working together as a community to, to find answers. And uh, if we're missing something, uh, we're more than open to taking a look at it and, and seeing how we can move forward. And we're going to be posting that. I'll send this, this presentation around, but we're also going to be posting it on the website and then kind of updating as we go along. Same with homicides and non-field shootings. So the public, you know, can have access to this. If anyone else sees any trends or has questions, we just want to put it out there and um, for everyone to look at. Thank you, everybody.